Well, you know, the weapons inspectors that the U.S. had looking for all those weapons of mass destruction in Iraq finally gave up. Uh, they gave up around Christmas time, and it was this past week that we finally got notification that they had given up and left Iraq, figuring that there was nothing there to find. You may remember that back in 2002, oh, we were so young then, so naive, the year before the Iraqi war began, the U.N. Security Council ordered Iraq to produce a report listing all of its biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons in, in development or whatever, where they came from, what happened to them, the past and present, the, you know, a complete report. Well, the Iraqi officials complied, and they produced an 11,800-page report, 11,800 pages on their weapons programs. The report described all the chemical and biological weapons the country once had, where they came from, and what was done with them, as well as what had happened to Iraq's nuclear weapons program. And although the report was prepared for the UN, U.S. officials intercepted the report, edited out 8,000 of the almost 12,000 pages. In other words, they edited out two-thirds of the report and then delivered this Reader's Digest version that was left. They delivered that to the UN. Now, a little bit later, a German reporter managed to get hold of a copy of the original complete report from Iraq and then compared it with the, man, with the truncated copy that the U.S. gave to the U.N., and the reporter found that the missing parts covered the Iraqis' acquisition of chemical and biological weapons from the United States. In other words, all those weapons that the U.S. had given to or supplied or sold one way or another to Iraq during the 1980s in order to fight the Iraq-Iran War, all of that was edited out by U.S. officials. And they also edited out information about non-fissionable materials for a nuclear bomb that the U.S. had given to the Iraqis. And they also edited out the training of Iraqi nuclear scientists at U.S. nuclear facilities in Los Alamos and uh, Sandia and at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in Berkeley. So anyway, the basic points made in the report were, number one, Iraq once had chemical and biological weapons. Number two, some of those weapons were destroyed at the end of the Gulf War and the rest of them were destroyed under the supervision of the U.N. weapons inspectors. Number three, Iraq once had a program to develop nuclear weapons. Number four, some of the nuclear weapons facilities were destroyed at the end of the Gulf War. The rest were destroyed under the supervision of the U.N. weapons inspectors. And Hans Blick, the head of the U.N.'s weapon inspection uh, up to the end, just before the Iraqi war, said that the conclusions stated in the report were basically true and that Iraq no longer had any dangerous weapons. Now, of course, the U.S. officials responded to this by saying, oh, balderdash, it's all just more lying and so on. Colin Powell dismissed the report uh, by saying it was a catalog of recycled information and flagrant emissions. Well, of course, we now know that the information was recycled because it happened to be true, and the emissions were flagrant because the U.S. officials had done the omitting. Hussein said he would like to bring the U.N. weapons inspectors back to Iraq. They had left in 1998 for safety reasons because President Clinton announced that he was resuming airstrikes against Iraq. And anyway, when Hussein said he'd like to bring the U.N. weapons inspectors back into Iraq, Bush called the offer a cynical ploy and managed to nip any idea in the bud. Hussein also invited the U.S. Congress to send representatives accompanied by experts to inspect any facilities that they wanted to inspect. And President Bush said this changed nothing, and he managed to derail the sending of a congressional delegation, and so that was out. Over and over, George Bush told us that Saddam Hussein was lying, that he was dragging his feet, that Iraq had dangerous weapons, that Hussein was a threat to the whole world. Now here we are two years later, and what have we learned? We have learned that the hunt for weapons of mass destruction has, been, uh, has turned up exactly nothing, and so the hunt has been called off. We've learned that everything that Hussein said about the weapons has turned out to be true. And we've learned that everything George Bush said about Iraqi's weapons, Iraq's weapons, has turned out to be false. Now, the Bush administration is trying to sugarcoat those conclusions by saying that the recently concluded weapons hunt by Charles Dulfer and the CIA's Iraq survey group discovered an, quote, intent, unquote, by Hussein to renew his weapons of mass destruction programs if the U.S. would just stay out of Iraq. However, Dufler has provided absolutely no hard evidence of any such intent, and once again, we're getting firm assertions backed up by nothing. Now, Scott Ritter was a weapons inspector during the 1990s, and he has summed it all up very well. And I want to quote word for word what he said. Quote, One of the tragic ironies of the decision to invade Iraq is that the Iraqi WMD declaration that was required back in 2002 and summarily rejected by Bush and Blair as repackaged falsehoods now stands as the most accurate compilation of data ever yet assembled regarding Iraq's WMD programs. 
more so than even the Dupa report, which contains many unsubstantiated declarations or speculations. Excuse me. Saddam Hussein has is yet to be contradicted on a single point of substantive fact. Iraq had disarmed, and no one wanted to accept that conclusion. End of quote. In other words, the butcher of Baghdad was correct. The president of the United States of America was wrong. The butcher of Baghdad will be put on trial for war crimes and crimes of other kinds, while the president of the United States has been reelected to lead the country for four more years. All I can say is it's a sorry state of affairs in America when you can trust the words of Saddam Hussein more than those of your own president. Ah! But that's the way it has turned out. Well, it's all very funny. It would make a nice Kingsley Amis novel about the ridiculousness of war, except for one fact. Upwards of 100,000 people are dead as a result of it. Cities are destroyed, and Iraq is a complete mess. That, unfortunately, is the tragic outcome, and it isn't very funny. Well, you know, I talked in the first segment about what they have been saying, had been saying about Iraq two years ago and how it turned out to be false. And there's a litany that develops, and it's, it's just a repetition of the same words over and over again. We heard it from Bush over and over in 2002 and 2003 that if Saddam Hussein doesn't disarm, we're going to have to disarm him. And he's dragged his feet, and he's violated uh, X number of UN resolution, resolutions and so forth. And what are we hearing today? Well, that Hussein dragged his feet for 12 years, and uh, he didn't disarm, so we had to go in to disarm him. And, and he's, he violated so many resolutions. And, of course, even after the Abu Ghraib prison revelations came out about U.S. soldiers uh, using torture, and uh, they called it abuse, but it was really torture, on Iraqis that had been captured and kept in the prison there, even after that came out, Bush was talking about Hussein's torture chambers and rape rooms and how that had to be stopped, and that's why the U.S. had to go in. In other words, the words never change no matter what the reality is. No matter what, how the reality refutes the words, the words go on just blah, 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 blah. And it's interesting. I sometimes read the transcripts, of, in addition to Bush's speeches, I read the transcripts of Scott McClellan's press briefings. Scott McClellan is the... Bush administration press secretary, and he holds what they call press gaggles, where the members of the press come in every day virtually, and McClellan gives them some news from the administration, and it's an opportunity for the members of the press to ask questions about various things that are going on, and McClellan answers them. And it is amazing, if you ever see these things on television, how articulate he is in being able to answer these things, in other words, to espouse the Bush line. But part of the reason he can do that is because he just keeps saying the same things over and over again, regardless of the question or regardless of what reality has done. I'll give you an example from one just a couple of days ago. Somebody asked, to what extent is the president concerned that Iraq has become or is becoming a breeding ground for terrorism? And McClellan answers, quote, I think we talked about this before. The terrorists recognize how high the stakes are. We're fighting them abroad so that we don't have to fight them here at home. And the way to win the war on terrorism is to stay on the offensive and work with the international community to bring to justice those who seek to do us harm and to work together to advance freedom, particularly in the broad, middle, broader Middle East region. And that's how we ultimately defeat the ideology of hatred that terrorists espouse. Oh, and one more other thing. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, it is just amazing. They just keep repeating the stuff over and over again as though we're going to believe it. We have to stop them over there so they don't, uh, before they, <laughs> pardon me, we have to stop them over there so that we won't have to stop them over here. We have to fight them in Fallujah so that we won't have to fight them in New York. Let me tell you something. When I was in the Army and I couldn't understand why we were fighting in Korea, and I asked the captain of my basic training unit why this was going on, he repeated the same old slogan, we have to fight them in Korea so that we don't have to fight them in Los Angeles. And every war has been the same thing. Bush Sr. said pretty much the same thing about the Gulf War. And, of course, uh, they said it in the World War II. They, and Woodrow Wilson even said it in w World War I, even though the Germans had absolutely no reason, no motivation, no designs on invading the United States. There was absolutely nothing to be gained by doing so. And a country like Germany had no hope in the world of ever invading the United States, even if they had been crazy enough to think that they should. And the same thing was pretty much true in the Second World War. Hitler couldn't invade the United States. It was impossible. The Japanese were able to attack Pearl Harbor, but they didn't even make any attempt to uh, invade and occupy the Hawaiian Islands because it would have been impossible. But still, we heard the same thing. We have to fight them in the Pacific so that we don't have to fight them in California, and on and on and on. But I have put on the website, the Radio Links page, the... Um, I put a link to the press gaggles in case you'd like to look at some of them. I also put a link to an article 
called Can You Imagine Saddam Hussein Was Right and Bush Was Wrong? That's on my website now, harrybrown.org. If you would like to see it, it goes into the background of what I talked about in the first segment. And also on the radio links page is a link to the San Diego Libertarian Party, where I will be speaking two weeks from today, Saturday, January 29th. So if you're in Southern California or Western Arizona or maybe Southwestern Nevada, I hope you'll come on over to San Diego to the annual convention of the San Diego Libertarian Party because I'll be speaking twice that day and there'll be a special breakfast Sunday morning for contributors to the San Diego LP. And I would love to meet you and you would have an opportunity to associate with other libertarians. Now also on the Radio Links page is some very, very good news that occurred this past week. As you probably know, Congress passed laws in the 1980s dictating mandatory minimum sentences that must be imposed by judges in all federal cases. In other words, if somebody is convicted of dealing in marijuana, then there is a specific minimum sentence that the judge must Im impose. He can impose a longer sentence if he wants to, but he can't impose a shorter sentence. By law, he is prevented from doing so. Well, the good news is, this past week, the Supreme Court struck down that law. No longer must a judge apply, uh, comply with those mandatory minimums. He is supposed to use them as guidelines, which is what they're called, they're guidelines, but any judge who violated them, who gave a shorter sentence, could go to jail himself, I believe. Anyway, the Supreme Court says now they're guidelines, you should consult them, but you are not obligated to abide by them. Now, I want to talk about the significance of this case because it is far-reaching. Now, the background on this, of course, the, uh, should I say the motive or the, let's say the propaganda, that was spewed out in the 1980s to get these mandatory minimums passed came from the right-wing side that said that liberal justices, uh, pardon me, li liberal judges were letting people out too early, were giving, uh, the liberal judges were soft on crime and they were uh, imposing very short sentences and criminals were getting back out on the streets and so forth. And so Congress passed these minimums, uh, and I'll tell you more about the immediate pa uh, motivation of passing them, but they passed these minimums with the idea that this would keep people off the streets that were violent criminals that were causing so much problems. Well, of course, the result of it has been, not surprisingly, just the opposite. Violent criminals have been getting back out on the street, street early, and nonviolent criminals have been locked up and the keys thrown away. Now, this whole thing came about in the 1980s when a basketball player named Len Bias who had been drafted by the Boston Celtics, died of an overdose of cocaine. As I've mentioned on this show before, overdoses that you hear about generally are not overdoses. Somebody doesn't just accidentally take too much cocaine as a general rule, too much heroin or something of that sort. What they get, because the drugs are illegal and because they can't buy them from somebody like Bayer or Smith Klein in a measured dose so that they know what they get, they buy from somebody they haven't bought from before, some stranger on the street or through a connection, and they get something that is far more toxic than what they're used to taking, and they just take the same dose they always have, but it is two or three times as strong as what they had uh, been taking before, and the result is that they appear to have taken too much, which they have, but not because they accidentally did it, not because they intentionally did it, but because they got an unregular, they got an unmeasured dose of toxic toxicity from a stranger. Anyway, because Len Bias died, everybody in Boston was up in arms because he was going to be the the new hero in Boston and save the Celtics from the L.A. Lakers, who had been beating them in the finals in a few years. So. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, who was from Boston, went home to Boston, found out that everybody was very upset about this and something ought to be done about this and so forth and so on. So he went back to Washington and he told his aides that they needed to come up with laws that would be tough on drugs. So they came up with these mandatory minimums and they pushed them through Congress. Surprise, surprise, hardly anybody in Congress knew what was in the laws they were passing because they were passed in the heat of passion in the middle of the night, and nobody read the law, nobody really knew what was in them. And the person who was involved in writing the laws later recanted on this. And let me make a note. I will put on the Radio Links page a very, very, very good summary of all this that includes an interview with the fellow who... Uh, produced these mandatory minimum laws to begin with. And he has since recanted and said it was the worst mistake he ever made in his life. It was an excellent series that was done by PBS Frontline on this very subject, and they went into all of the things that had happened as a result of this, all of the small-time crooks who have gone away for 20 years and why it is that the violent ones get away. If part of the 
provision in the mandatory minimum law is that the U.S. attorneys who prosecute these cases can recommend to the judge that a shorter sentence be given if the U.S. attorneys have received substantial help from the defendant. In other words, if the defendant will turn in a bunch of other people, the U.S. attorney can go to the judge and say, this guy has been a help to us, go easy on him, and the judge can ignore the mandatory minimum and sentence the person to a shorter sentence. All right, so what happens if somebody who gets coffee and newspapers for the drug kingpin is arrested? Well, he can't really turn anybody over under him. Oh, he doesn't know, really know that much about anybody or the customers or the connections or anything else. So he gets the mandatory minimum. But if they arrest the drug kingpin, the drug kingpin knows everybody. So the drug kingpin can roll over on a whole bunch of different people and su su supply substantial assistance to the U.S. attorney, who will then recommend to the judge that the drug kingpin get a shorter sentence than is mandated by the congressional law. The result is that a nonviolent flunky will wind up going to prison for 20 years, and a very, very violent kingpin will go to prison for three years. And three years later, he's back out on the street committing more violence. Exactly the thing that the law was designed to stop. This is how laws work. They almost always produce the opposite of what was touted for them when they were first passed in the heat of the night. Just like the Homeland Security. Well, it hasn't made us more secure. It's just given us a new bunch of people to be afraid of, meaning the inspectors at the airports and others who could make life very, very miserable for us, could even send us to jail if we don't obey. Uh, the mandatory minimums have been a disastrous, disastrous failure in trying to produce the result that was touted for them, that it would get the violent people off the street. What it has done is to load up our prisons, really overload them, with thousands, if not millions, of nonviolent criminals. I don't have the statistics at hand, but huge percentages of both federal and state prisoners are have been convicted for nonviolent crimes, and they are clogging up the system. And so what happens is the violent criminals make plea bargains, turn over some people that they know, and they get out early. Some of them even get out on early release from whatever their sentence was because the prisons are so overcrowded. Now, when the Supreme Court this past Wednesday struck down the mandatory minimums, which, as I said, is very, very good news for America, if they will just stay down, it probably will mean a reduction in what is the largest prison population in the world, largest prison population per capita in the entire world, and the largest number of nonviolent criminals locked up, even greater than in the worst police state in the world, police state as we think of it, that it will be a great thing for America. But, of course... Not everybody agrees with me. And some of the people who don't agree with me are in the Congress of the United States of America. Senator Orrin Hatch, for example, who was the head of the Judiciary Committee at the time they passed this, and he said we will need to examine our options carefully because the Supreme Court said that the ball was now back in Congress court, and so Hatch is saying we will need to ex examine, in effect, how we can repair this terrible damage that the Supreme Court has done. But... Hatch is no longer the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's now Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania. And although he is a Republican, he is more likely to go along with the Supreme Court decision than Hatch would have. But uh, last year, House Republicans uh, wrote a provision blocking federal judges from engaging in what are called downward departures. In other words, uh, to stop this business of the U.S. attorneys recommending lower sentences and letting the judges do so. And... Uh, he doesn't think that this was a very good thing. Uh, that's Tom Feeney. Pardon me, uh, I didn't mention his name before. Tom Feeney, a Republican of uh, Florida. And he said, The Supreme Court's decision to place this extraordinary power to sentence a person solely in the hands of a single federal judge who is accountable to no one, that flies in the face of the clear will of Congress. And he said the decision was an egregious overreach. Well, Let's just imagine, uh, examine that, if we can, for a moment, because this is so typical of so many laws. Feeney is saying a judge should not have the discretion to make this decision, to have it in the hands of a single federal judge who is accountable to no one, according to Feeney. So instead, it should be the will of Congress. But what is the will of Congress? The will of Congress is some unnamed congressional aide in the middle of the night sitting at his word processor in his office while everybody else is asleep typing away what he thinks 
the mandatory minimums ought to be and which should apply to every federal judge in the country. And this congressional aide is accountable to no one. And his boss will take what the congressional aide comes out up with and take it out to the Judiciary Committee, get it passed there, and then get it passed on the floor of the House, voted on by people who have no idea what they're doing. It's not just that they haven't read the law. It's not just that they don't know what the provisions of the law are that they're voting on. It is that they don't know anything about the subject they're voting on. Can you imagine that these people in Congress are voting on such things as how big a package should be uh, by federal law in some particular industry, or how some labeling should be on some package, or something else uh, having to do with science, or the military, or medicine, or finance, or business. And these people have no personal knowledge about these subjects at all. Oh yeah, they hold hearings and they get experts in, but who decides who the experts are going to be? Some congressional aide who's got an axe to grind who wants to see this bill passed, and so he stacks the committee hearings so that all you're ever going to hear on television and all that these uh, senators or representatives are going to hear are basically one side of the story and then some weak people coming in from the other side. The typical way of doing it is to have, for instance, if they're going to apply more regulation on business, is to have some experts from academia, from science, and from other places, obviously non-partial, come in and testify on behalf of this bill. And to testify against the bill are public relations people from some industries or companies who obviously have a vested interest. And so the whole thing is stacked from the beginning that it is the neutral people who have decided the bill is necessary and the special interests have decided it isn't. And this is the way bills get passed. This is what is running our lives. This is, these are the laws that we are supposed to abide by and the laws of which ignorance is no excuse. And we just have a few minutes left in this final segment of the first hour. So let me take that time to reiterate what I was saying at the end of the last segment, that all of these laws that we are supposed to abide by, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a federal law on narcotics, on the dangers of marijuana, doesn't matter whether you're talking about the military going in and invading a foreign country, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about where your taxpayer money is going to go to which foreign dictators are going to get the most money out of your pocket. It doesn't matter whether it is a mandatory seatbelt law. It doesn't matter whether it is some uh, direction as to how the drug companies must operate or what kind of reports mutual fund companies have to supply to the government or how the tax laws will be implemented uh, against individual taxpayers. It doesn't matter what kind of a law you're talking about. The people who have passed this law, the people who have voted on it, the people who have maybe changed your life, maybe destroyed your business in the process, or maybe put on you a burden that is going to change the way your family can live, the people who have passed that law don't know diddly squat about the subject that is covered by the law. These people are not elected to Congress because of their knowledge of medicine or science or military strategy or foreign affairs or commerce or securities, or any of these things, that's not why they're elected to Congress. They're elected to Congress because they're better at raising money, they are better at making connections, they are better at insinuating themselves into one of the two major parties, and they stay in Congress not because their record is so good, but because the laws are written so that once somebody does get his way into Congress, he is almost guaranteed of continual re-election. The re-election rate of incumbents is well over 90%, every other year after every other year after every other year after every other year. And that's no accident, and that is no grade A-plus being given to congressmen. It is because the campaign finance laws, the ballot access laws, and a number of other laws are written to guarantee the incumbent's re-election. The last time they passed a campaign finance law, somebody, I think it was Emmett Terrell, dubbed it the guaranteed re-election of incumbency law. And we don't seem to have any phone calls tonight. And Scott Hartman, our wonderful engineer in Minnesota, was just telling me that it's been that way for the past few days. I don't know what it is. I guess everybody is just too busy glued to their television sets waiting for news of the upcoming Iraqi elections and wanting to know what the latest uh, info is about how those elections are going to go and are they going to take place and what's the turnout going to be like. And I mean, can you think of anything more important that's going on in our lives right now? So that's probably why we're not getting calls. But uh, the phone number is 1-800-259-9231 if you would like to call or send me an email, question at harrybrown.org. Speaking of those very, very, very important elections, it reminds me that, oh gosh, uh, way back in 2003, when after Bush had declared mission accomplished when Baghdad had been, been stormed and overcome with shock and awe and captured and occupied, but still the resistance went on, uh, the folks who were 
<laughs> the folks who brought us this World War X or whatever it is, said, well, the resistance will collapse once Saddam Hussein is found and captured. Well, Saddam Hussein was found and captured, and the resistance continued. And then uh, in the early months of last year, they said, well, the resistance will collapse uh, once sovereignty is turned over to the Iraqi government on June 30th, 2004. Well, on June 30th, 2004, sovereignty, if you want to call it that, was turned over to the Iraqi government. And the resistance continued. In fact, it seemed to get worse. And now the story is, well, the resistance will collapse once democracy has been brought to Iraq. The elections have gone on as scheduled, and the terrorists will see that they cannot stop the progress in Iraq. And Bush, in his speeches this month, has been going on and on about what an earth-shaking thing this is, that they're holding these elections in Iraq that this is really, really something revolutionary, that now democracy has come to a Middle East country. And, of course, I've mentioned before several times in this show that they had democracy in Iran back in the early 50s, only to see it destroyed by a CIA-inspired coup that kicked out the democratic government and brought in the Shah of Iran, who was then supported by the United States in money and military hardware and conducted a very oppressive non-democratic government until he was finally kicked out in the late 1970s. But that's beside the point. The thing is that Bush is going on and on about this being a big thing. Well, you know something? They held elections in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria and Romania and Hungary and Yugoslavia and Albania uh, and Armenia throughout the Cold War. They had elections all the time. And, in fact, the biggest elections were the ones that were held just after the Soviets invaded Poland and Hungary and all these countries and kicked out the Nazis who had been occupying them in World War II. Soviets moved in, liberated these countries, and then refused to leave. Sort of like, that sounds familiar. What's that like? Oh, yeah, like the United States liberating Iraq. And, anyway, the Soviets made sure that a pro-Soviet government was installed. They were not so blatantly heavy-handed as to have a Russian come in and be the viceroy in Poland. No, they made sure that the government was run by Poles, but that those Poles were pro-Soviet. And lo and behold, they then made deals to keep Soviet troops in Poland. And that way, the Soviets made sure that nothing ever happened that wasn't with their approval. Now, Donald Rumsfeld, way back in 2003, laid out all the conditions that were necessary for Iraq. Uh, We want democracy there, but of course we don't want them to... Uh, break up the country into the three parts, as many people think it should be done with the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites each having their own section. No, we don't want the country to be run by a theological government. Uh, that's out. And he listed all kinds of other things that the United States would not tolerate, even though the United States wanted a democracy in Iraq. Anyway, the point is that elections don't mean anything. My <laughs> God, just look at the elections in the United States. What do they mean? For years and years, the Democrats controlled Congress, and we saw government get bigger and bigger and bigger year after year after year. But finally, in 1994, a great revolution occurred. The Democrats no longer had control of Congress. The Republicans did, and they had a contract for America, and on and on and on. And then in 2000, they even added to that a Republican president, and now people are talking about the demise of the Democratic Party and everything. We've had a complete change from Democrat uh, control to Republican control. And what has been the result? Government gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If they didn't wear labels, you wouldn't notice the difference. Nothing has changed. The elections really seem to mean nothing. The only thing they mean to me is an opportunity for a libertarian to get some airtime that he wouldn't get in a non-election season. And beyond that, I don't really see much significance in the elections. I can't imagine that if John Kerry had been elected president, it would be much better or much worse than what we're getting now. It's hard to see how it could be worse, but in any event... It uh, wouldn't be much different. And it wouldn't have been much different if Robert Dole had been elected in 96 instead of Bill Clinton. So much for the elections. Uh, Kayleen in Massachusetts, whom you know from her phone calls, says, I spoke to you on the phone last week and mentioned the website of an international libertarian group, Freedom Force. Perhaps I've missed it, but I don't believe you put that link on your website. It is freedomforce.org. All right, uh, that's freedom-force.org, and I will put it on the Radio Links page tonight. I did take a look at it. And I don't see any reason not to mention it on the Radio Links page. Bob out there in cyberspace says, I don't believe there should be any punishment for victimless crimes like substance abuse. But where there is a victim, I believe the criminal should be liable to the victim, not to the government. And if I may interject, I certainly agree with that. Uh, We always find these cases where the, the perpetrator of some crime is supposed to pay some amount of money to the government. But... Very rarely is there a provision in a criminal trial for restitution to the victim. There is, of course, in civil trials, but that's because the victim has brought the case against the perpetrator. But, as Bob says, the criminal should be liable to the victim, not to the government. Uh, 
They should not be paying their debt to society, but to the victim. Well put, Bob. Would you please spend a few moments to talk about how victims were compensated in the past and how the criminals of today should be repaying their debts to the victims? Is it possible that the government can be effectively removed from the picture as custodian for the criminal and still have the victim repaid? Uh, I want to answer Bob's question about compensation to victims rather than to the government, and I wish I could give you a good answer. I cannot answer the question about how victims have been compensated in the past, in other words, historical examples from societies where this was done in a much better way than it has been done here. And Bob asked, how can the government be removed from the picture as custodian for the criminal and still have the victim repaid? And actually, this has been a subject that has interested classical libertarians. I don't hear much about it in recent years, but a lot of classical libertarians, in other words, ones that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years, have always maintained that this was an important thing, that victims should be compensated more than uh, offenders punished in the sense of uh, paying some debt to the state, either in time or in money. And Andrew Galambos, who was a a very great thinker in the Los Angeles area, conducted classes on a libertarian society, although he didn't call it that. And his feeling was that in the judiciary system, that even in a case of murder, that you couldn't monetize the debt that the criminal owed to the family whose, whose member had been murdered, that there's no way that any amount of money could replace the person that died, but that if you took into consideration, for instance, the breadwinner's income, potential over the next X number of years or whatever, you could monetize it and that it was up to the criminal to work this off and work it off in some way under supervision, either incarcerated or not, whatever, but that would repay the victim. And really beyond that, I just have not investigated this enough to give you much of a coherent answer. So rather than stumbling around on this subject further, let me defer to someone out in cyberspace who probably does know what he's talking about. And that, to begin with, is William in California. So good evening, William. Hi, great show and um, a great career you had. Really appreciate your work over the years. Well, thank you. Um, and it's, um, it's been, you've been way ahead of your time most of it, uh, 90%. Um, I, I think in Iraq, unfortunately, the problem is is we don't want democracy in Iraq. We want to have a government that's dependent upon us. And after the election, um, there, the, the Iraqi resistance is only going to get stronger rather than weaker. Because the, right now we're only fighting 20% of the population, the Sunnis. Um, when after the election, the other 60% of the population, the Shiites, who have been, who have been waiting for us to leave, they're going to realize we're never going to leave Iraq. We're there to control the oil supply of the world. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, and it has been maintained all along uh, from the very beginning of this war that when it was over, the United States was going to have 12 military permanent bases basis. right in Iraq. And the word permanent, as you uttered it, is uh, very significant because that is the word that has been used. And so when uh, Iraqis realize that this is the case, a lot more of them are at least going to be sympathetic to the resistance, uh, even if they don't participate in it themselves. And, of course, uh, this leads to the taking of hostages and so on, which the military, our military, has already done there. They have been locking people up and saying we're going to keep these people locked up, even though they're innocent, until somebody comes forward and gives us the kind of information on where the terrorists are, the information that we don't have. And this is going to get greater and greater. And, of course, those acts, rather than suppressing terrorism, just give more food to the terrorists to be able to recruit more people the saddest, to help them. The saddest thing of all, I was involved in the Vietnam War, and there was a dozen Vietnamese divisions fighting on our side. And they fought. They were fighting for their country, South Vietnam. And, uh, and in this war, there's the Iraqi army and the Iraqi police forces actually re, has actually fallen by 50% in number in the last year. Oh, yeah, there have been enormous desertions, and, and every time they say, we're going to go in and take this town, <laughs> half the Iraqis disappear. The American people don't know that. Is, is there, is, our troops are out there on their own. In a, see, the Israelis have been fighting Islamic terrorism in, in, in the Palestine area for 40 years. They know the language, they know the customs, and their country is there. They live there, and they can't, they can't beat it. Yes. Yeah, as so it's I, impossible for our troops to do it. As I said last week, they keep telling us that a proper show of force will finally make these people realize that they can't win and they'll stop fighting us. But the Israelis have been showing force to the Palestinians for 40 years, as you said, uh, actually 50 years, and uh, 60 years, and still... Uh, they don't stop the Palestinians, and the Palestinians on the other side, they show force to the Israelis, and it hasn't made the Israelis back The most down. awful thing that's going to happen is, I think, this is a terrible word, but I think we're committing genocide in Iraq. I think we're intentionally killing the population, and Fallujah is genocide. And why, why would you think it was intentional? It is intentional, because the only, there's only two ways to win a guerrilla war. Um, is either, either bring the people around to your side or depopulate the area. Those are the only two ways to win. There is not a third way of winning a guerrilla war. And the, like the Russians and the Chinese are real good at depopulating the area. 
But uh, in Vietnam, we killed 2 million Vietnamese, and they still fought on because it was their country. And yes. this is the same in Iraq, even worse in Iraq, because in Vietnam, the Vietnamese were only 20 million people, and there were no other Vietnamese around. They were being supported by the Chinese and the Russians, but only with equipment and supplies, not with real manpower. Here, there, there's, there's 300 million Arabs that we mm-hmm. fought our army down in the middle of, and they'll be supplied with manpower from the outside forever. And so much of this could have been avoided if only a president of the United States paid any attention to history and had any idea about the culture and the, the background of the area in which he presumed to remake. Well, see, they don't care anything about that. Right now the world is, is, has used up half its oil supply, and the second half is going to be used up in the next 40 years or so. And, they, and the United States was endowed with a lot of oil, but we've used 90% of it up. Most Americans don't know we only have four years' worth of oil underneath us in North America at our present rate of consumption. We have about... 30 million billion barrels of oil in the, in the United States underground, and we're using 7.5 billion barrels a year. And so without the control of the Middle East, we're, we're, our economy would collapse. Let's talk with Eugene in Ohio. Good evening, Eugene. Good evening, Harry. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's on your mind tonight? I've got to disagree with you for something you said last week. Oh, my goodness. You said force doesn't work. Well, historically, force works great. It may not give you the results you want or the results you claim, and it may not be moral, but if you look at history, it was worse that allowed us to seize from Britain. It was worse that allowed us to get land from Mexico, to get rid of the Indians, to get to prevent the South from seceding during the Civil War, to obtain colonies during the Spanish-American War, and worse that allowed North Vietnam to conquer South Vietnam. Also, if you look throughout the United States, most large cities have stadiums, usually tax supported and it forces one of the most important changes in human history. Finally, uh, you said you mentioned you were in a wee pack during the 50s? Yes. Did you see any of the tests? Yes, I did. I saw one H-bomb test. Okay, well, I was there in the late 70s, and I, yeah, I can say government uh, programs don't always deliver what they claim. Well, I didn't get killed in the test, and that might have been a, uh, a result that they would have liked. Okay, but they did build a hydrogen bomb. But getting back to my more, more important problems, because force does work. Whether you like, you know, whether, again, whether you deliver the results you want is not a matter. Whether it's moral is not a matter. But don't write off the effectiveness of force, which may change the world. Okay, well, let, let me say, first of all, uh, regarding the um, H-bomb test, uh, it's interesting because that's very often held up not so much as an example of force, but just plain government does work. Look at the, what they did. Well, as a matter of fact, it took them several years longer than they expected it to take. It took them far, far much more mo- money than they expected it to take, because it really was billions of dollars even back in the 40s. And even more so, they did it so badly that the Russians got all pretty much all of the important information out of it because the uh, whole program was riddled with spies. Right. And, uh, the Manhattan Project. Yeah. The, uh, I'm sorry. You sh- should have clarified that. The Manhattan Project to build the A-bomb. Right. Uh, but getting back to force, what I was really saying last week, and I, perhaps I uh, really should have made myself clear, was that I wasn't speaking about whether force has worked for Attila the Hun mm-hmm. or anything else. What I was talking about was that to the people who listen to this show, which by definition must be good, God-fearing, uh, liberty-loving people, yeah. uh, that you are not going to get what you want by force. That if you may think that if you could get a law passed to force this or force that, uh, it's not going to give you what you want. You're going to wind up disappointed, and in fact you may get exactly the opposite of what you wanted, which is which means you've made things worse. Right. And, and the example that I gave a little while ago about the mandatory minimums, this was supposed to get the violent criminals off the street, and it actually has promoted keeping the violent uh, criminals on the street and putting non violent criminals in prison. Right, right. So what I'm saying is to the, to the average person, uh, do not expect to get uh, what you want with force, but which is to not to deny what you have just said, that scheming, um, well, brutal people in history have done a great deal to accomplish their own ends through force. Right. Well, plus, like a special stadium, people say, oh, look at this great stadium we have. Yeah, they don't right. what might have come about, and the people have been allowed to keep their money. Plus, you see the riots after a lot of the sports teams, uh, sports teams, I think we're better off without them. Oh, yeah. Well, um, and for one thing, when a stadium is privately built, uh, you have some rules that make sense that help to keep rowdiness in line, whereas a public stadium is uh, hamstrung by all kinds of uh, rules about uh, discrimination and you know, other things of that sort, which one way or another serve to make it more difficult to provide the kind of environment that the fans actually thought they were going to get. Right. So thanks for clarifying that, Eugene. I appreciate it. And you're absolutely right that there are uh, people in history that have definitely profited from force. There are people who are profiting from force at this very moment. Uh, but you or I are not going to be able to do so. Thanks so much. Let's uh, talk now with Roger in Clymer, New York. Hey. Hi, you, Roger. I haven't heard from you in a while. I know. I haven't heard. Well, I haven't. You haven't been listening to the show. Go ahead and admit well, it. Well, no, no, no. Admit I, it, and we, and we will give you some kind of re-education program. Well, no, that's not it. It's just as I'd be lying down listening to it over the Internet, and I'd fall asleep. <laughs> I wish you had said that. <laughs> anyway, well, anyway, I, anyway, I'm looking forward to those elections in Iraq. I hope they have the same elections that we have in this country. Okay. By, by two parties that don't care about the American people, that, so they get 99% re-election, yeah, you know, 
And uh, let's see, what else? <laughs> you can't get 99% re-election when nobody's in office now. Well, but, I know, but the thing is, what we'll get is... is know, it, well, 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 you're, you are right, though. I shouldn't say that because the interim government will probably get uh, re-elected. Uh, the interim government, which was established by the United States, will probably, their party will probably be the overwhelming winner. I can't swear to that, but that seems the most likely outcome. So uh, you're right. I mean, we should inflict on them what's been inflicted on us. <laughs> of course. Uh, and, of course, didn't we go over there to make trouble? Uh, absolutely. And also... Um, yeah. Oh, incidentally, before you go on, you said two parties. I, I read somewhere that there is something like 240 parties that are uh, established there now that have set up shop in some way and are participating in these elections. And I also read somewhere that they are, they are not revealing the names of the candidates until Election Day because they don't want any of them to be shot. So this is going to be quite an election. But go ahead with what you were going to say. Also, I wanted to um, mention to you that uh, there is a slight error in your January 11, 2005 blog journal. What was that? Well, you're sitting there saying, conservative pundits making a big thing over the falsehoods from Memo Gate and Iraqi. Oh, yes. And you said, none that I know of. Well, Happy, uh, Happy Cannon's made a few comments about how we shouldn't be over in Iraq and, and the war, and so is Paul Craig Roberts. He's about as good a conservative or libertarian or whatever you could want. Yeah, I would, I would have to say that Paul Craig Roberts, although once I would have called him a conservative, I would certainly call him a libertarian today. He has done such good work in identifying the problems in the law enforcement area and the, the, the terrible things that U.S. attorneys are doing and so on. And I, I really have been surprised at how libertarian he is, and he's a wonderful investigative reporter. Now, with Buchanan, he has definitely criticized the war in Iraq. Whether he has referred outright to the falsehoods that have been told, that I'm not sure. Do you know? Um... I think he has mentioned it, but I couldn't, like, right now come up with the, 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 the article, per se. Okay. Well, uh, that music means we need to move along. Uh, thanks so much for calling, Roger. Good to hear from you again. Let's go right back to the telephones and talk with Cecil in Arizona. Good evening, Cecil. Good evening, Harry. What's up? Uh, you said that uh, the good thing about elections is that they're already based on the Libertarian candidates get to speak out. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with you. that uh, I've seen this at statewide elections here that the uh, Libertarian candidate won the debate hands down. What was the office? Governor. Uh, who was it? Was that Barry Hess? Yes, it was. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear he did a good job. Uh, he was excellent. And so he was in a televised debate with a Republican and Democrat? It wasn't televised. It was oh. just a local debate here. But but it was the Republican and Democratic governors, yep. uh, candidates? Well, that's great uh, that he was able to get into the debate. Uh, uh, the problem being, there's, there's no local grassroots organization. And uh, my thinking here is, if we're going to uh, fix this country, we've got to start by cleaning up our local government. And, our, and then move it up to our state government. And I've uh, spoken with the uh, Libertarian uh, Party county chairman, and we've spoken, we're friends, we've spoken at length, and he kind of complains, and I said, get us a good candidate. I'll bring Republicans over to help you get him elected. Uh, my question is, why is it that the, Repub or the uh, Libertarian Party hasn't put forth a program to organize a strong organization at County level. Well, actually, the party nationally has done a lot in that regard. They have provided uh, recruiting kits. They have provided organizational kits to set up a new county organization and, and these sort of things over the years. And it, uh, like so many things, it moves in waves that there are periods where a great deal of emphasis is put on that, and then it seems to go to the back burner for a while and then back to the front and so forth. Uh, could I ask you what county you're in, uh, what part of Arizona? Yuma County, southwest corner. Okay. I don't know much about that. There, of course, are very... Uh, active organizations in Phoenix and Tucson, I know that, yes. and uh, uh, probably in some other counties. But this is one of those situations where if it's going to get done, you're probably going to have to do it. Uh, but you could contact the national office and ask them what they might have available that could help you do that. Well, and, and maybe I'm not saying you have to do it all by yeah. yourself, but you already know some people there. And But it may be that it's you that's going to have to take the initiative to get other people moving uh, to finally do something. And so often that's the case. I can't tell you how many emails I get from you libertarians, uh, you, you're just content talking to yourselves all the time. Here's what you have to do, and it'll lay out about ten things that that the Libertarian Party ought to do, or you know, or that libertarians should do in order to uh, finally make a difference in this country. And the only thing I can do is to write back and say, well, uh, I hope you succeed in these ten things that you think ought to be done. Uh, go ahead and get started doing them, because uh, uh, it, it all comes back to either you're going to do it yourself, or you're going to sit there and just watch it not happen. Sure, I'm I'm the president of the local Republican Assembly. Oh, oh. did you say that before? Yeah. No, I didn't. Okay, I was afraid I missed it. Um, we're, we're very involved there, and we've had quite a little success at uh, bringing the Republican Party back closer to Libertarian here in, in the county and in the state. And I'm a believer in working together. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we in the, uh, in the Republican Assembly and the Libertarians work together, we can accomplish a lot. 
Well, that's very possible, and uh, I come back to what I said before. Maybe as a, as a Republican official, you shouldn't be the one to be organizing the local libertarians, but oh, no. since, you, since you have connections there, uh, you can kind of press them to do this and even take it on yourself to call the National LP and see what they have available and get what they have available and then impress it upon the local libertarians that here, here are the tools. Why don't you get started and do something so that I can then help you from my side? Yeah, they, they are doing something. They have a good chairman. Good. They just don't have enough members to accomplish much. Good. And with regard to starting at the local level, it's really a situation where you start where you can. And if you can get people elected at the local level, that's fine. Uh, there may be an opportunity to get somebody elected at the statewide, uh, not statewide, but to a state office like yeah. an assembly or something. And good, take advantage of it. Uh, but one thing that we need to realize that is 90% of the elections that libertarians participate in today has to be really just for outreach, using the opportunity to get radio and TV time, you know, when interviews, uh, to be able to spread the libertarian message and show people how much better their lives could be if we could just get government out of it, and it's libertarians that are trying to make this happen for you. And um, uh, every once in a great while, an election will be won, but that shouldn't really be the object to start with. Thanks so much for your call, Cecil, and uh, keep in touch and let us know how that's coming. And this is the final segment. We have some emails I want to run through in a hurry here. In answer to Bob's question about compensation to victims by the perpetrators of crimes, David in Minneapolis says, In England during the Anglo-Saxon era, if person A murdered person B, then the family of person B could demand monetary compensation in exchange for not going after person A in vengeance. I appreciate getting that information. Uh, Bob in turn uh, sent another email saying thanks for trying on the previous question it's a tough one he said one more question would you please take a moment about the, to talk about the upcoming inauguration and the celebration of liberty it's supposed to portray well all I can say Bob is that it's just one more event out of 1984 George Orwell's 1984 where uh, slavery is freedom and war is peace and so forth and presidential inaugurations are celebrations of liberty uh, you know and the Iraqi people have been liberated and so on it's, it's just you know, all self-indulgence and self-congratulation. I got an email from Bill in New Jersey, who is campaigning for the New Jersey State Assembly, and he says that they are they have a full slate of Libertarian candidates this year, which is nice to hear. And he says, what do you think a few Libertarian members of the State Assembly could do to restore liberty to the residents of New Jersey with all of the tentacles of the federal government in virtually every area of our lives? Well, first of all, if you were to get elected somehow, then... Once again, just as with a campaign, use it as a podium from which to speak out. You would get a lot of airtime, radio and television, for the asking that you couldn't get as a non-assemblyman. And you should be introducing bills, just one bill after another, to repeal laws, to disband programs, and so on, and then use those as reasons to get on radio and television and explain how much better uh, the viewer or listener's lives would be if this bill could get passed. The bills probably won't get passed uh, because you only have a few... Uh, libertarians and a few libertarian sympathizers in your assembly or state senate, but you are getting this opportunity to speak to people. And as far as the federal government is concerned, you should use that as the again as the opportunity to let people know how much liberty they're losing and how much money they're losing because of these federal regulations that are trumping state laws. Sorry, I don't have time to go into it much further. Thanks so much for listening tonight, folks. I really do appreciate it. And I'm going to be back here next Saturday night, so I do hope you will be too. Good night, have a good week, and do something good for yourself and your family.